Um, the you know the the end of this chapter is the ellipse. So um, and then what that means is we'll need to schedule our test on this first chapter. There's going to be a problem set that goes along with it, and we have a couple of options. Um, one option is to you know go through the ellipse part. You know at least as much as we get through today. Um, we're going to start with your questions and then. Uh, in the absence of more questions, you know, start talking about the ellipse and um, either finish that today or finish it on Monday, and then we could schedule our test for that next Friday the 7th. If we do that, then after we finish the section on the ellipse, I won't start any new material until after that test. Um, I'll also post the um, problem set to Canvas and and um, email it to Ms. Morgan Puglisi so that you can have copies uh, ready. Um, I'll, e I'll have that ready today regardless. I'll, I'll be able to post that today. Um, the other option is that if you don't want to do it a week from tomorrow, we could shoot for the f like uh, a day the following week, which I guess would be, when do we not have class? Tuesday? Tuesday the 11th? Um, in that instance, there's, it's a possibility that we might take a day and, and start covering, you know, a day or two, like depending on where we are, start covering new material that won't be on the test. Um, so I don't know if you have a preference about that. Um, are there any immediate uh, thoughts about whether you prefer to have the test on Friday the 7th or Tuesday the 11th? Uh, can you say that again? Oh, we're on break. Right, we're on break the week of the seventeenth. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, perfect. So, I mean, regardless, you know, we'll have we'll get this first test out of the way before that first break. Um, does that impact? Is, for anybody, the choice of whether you prefer to take it a week from tomorrow or a week from Tuesday? <laughs> no. Is it too early to have, like, opinions, strong opinions on this, or maybe? Okay, I mean, it literally does not matter to me. Like, I have no dog in this fight. So, um, if I were to just randomly pick between the 7th and the 11th, everybody would be like, okay, that's fine. Yeah? Okay. You're, the, does that, so I take that to mean that you're feeling okay about the material that we've been going over so far? Okay. Great. So, then I think what I'll do is plan on doing it the 7th. That way we'll kind of finish up this material, we'll have a, at least one full day with just questions on this chapter and for you to ask questions on the problem set um, as you're working on it. And um, uh, let's see, and then uh, we won't cover any new material before we take that test, so maybe there's an advantage to that. Um, okay, so, uh, so we'll have it Friday the 7th. And the problem set will be due this day as well. And I'll have that um, I'll have that posted to Canvas and emailed to Ms. Morgan Puglisi today, uh, like by this evening. Um, if you want, uh, like, if you want to get access to it, you're probably not on Canvas yet. Is that right? So. Correct. Um, if you want access to it, like electronic access to it, before you get the hard copy, you could send me an email and I could just reply with uh, and, and attach it or something um, if you're eager to get started. Some problem, I'll just say this right now, on problem sets, you know, on the problem sets are designed to kind of help us prepare for the test. But also, they're a place for us to work on more challenging problems. You know, on a test, you're expected to come in, sit down, and take the test in one sitting, right, and then be done with it and turn it in. 
So there are some problems of varying levels of difficulty, but most of them are kind of middle of the road difficulty. Um, and I don't put any like really, you know, difficult, super difficult problems on it because, you know, you need to sit down and take it and be done with it. The problem set sometimes will have some problems, not all of them, but it will have some problems that are more difficult. So um, this is my way of saying that when you get the problem set, start on it. Start on it right away. Give yourself time to get stuck on problems and ask questions and ask for help. Um, um, yeah, okay. So, all right, so we've, we've, fit, uh, we've figured that out. We're going to have our test on Friday the 7th. Um, I'll, I'll now turn to any questions that you might have on what we've been covering uh, yesterday and Monday. Any questions about circles or parabolas or... Are those exercises going okay? So I, um, I assume that you're spending some time on the exercises. You might not get around to doing them all, um, and that's okay. But just I want to make sure that you do spend time on the exercises. Uh, as I, like to, I, I guess I like to put it this way. I get paid to make everything look easy uh, when I'm doing it. So sometimes it can be difficult to see like exactly how you know where you might get stuck until you actually sit down and, and work out the problem. So if you've been having a hard time you know, spending time on those exercises, just I urge you to, to make time for that. If you've been working on them and they're going great, that's awesome. Um, let's talk about the ellipse. So we start with the geometric definition. Making an ellipse is, is pretty straightforward. So we say that it's the set of points such that the sum of its distances from two fixed points is constant. So you fix two points, and the, a point is on the ellipse if um, when you take the distance between that point and the two fixed points and add them together, that that sum is always the same. Now physically, the way you make an ellipse is simple, just from this definition. So imagine you have like you know, like a cork board or something where you could kind of stick two thumbtacks in it, all right? So fix those two thumbtacks. Those, each of those two fixed points is a focus, so plural foci. So you've got a couple foci. And then attach a string. One, you know, one end, you know, at attach a string so that uh, to one end and then the other, the other end of the string to the other end. And, and let it have some slack so the string is just sort of hanging down. Then pull that string till it's taut right, till it's tight. So like here's that string, I've pulled it all the way up. And I, the set of points where I can move like my pencil around, you know, like holding that string tight, where I can move that pencil around, that's the ellipse. So the sum of the distances is the same. Each of these two distances, D1 and D2, can change, right, will change, in fact. But when you add them together, they're always the same. We will focus first on ellipses with the center at the origin, uh, kind of like we did with the parabola and the vertices at the origin. Um, and then we'll see how we make adjustments to our equations for an ellipse whose you know, center is somewhere else. Um, so here's our kind of generic ellipse here. An ellipse could be oriented horizontally, like this one's oriented horizontally. It's kind of long horizontally. It could also be oriented the other way. Um, the um, Each of the points along the long end, each of these points is called a vertex. So an ellipse has two vertices. An ellipse has two axes of symmetry. Um, the long axis is called the major axis. And the short axis is called the minor axis.
Um, each of these vertices we say uh, has coordinates. In this case, since it's on the x-axis, it would be a0. And over here, negative a0. Now, because our center is, is uh, because our center is at the origin, a and negative a are actually the coordinates um, of the vertices. But in any ellipse, a represents the distance from the center out to a vertex. Um, the ends of the minor axis don't have a special name. We just call them the ends of the minor axis. And we say these have coordinates 0, b, and 0, negative b, because they're on the y-axis in this case. But for any ellipse, b is the distance from the center to the end of the minor. For any ellipse, c is the distance from the center to uh, each focus. Right, so in this case, each focus has coordinates c0 and negative c0. We're not going to derive the equation. As it turns out, the, the equation for an ellipse that is oriented horizontally, like this, and center at the origin, will have an equation that looks like this. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. So this is sort of similar to the equation of a circle in that both the x and the y are squared. What's different is that they'll have, um, they won't have the same coefficient. Uh, so with a circle, they had to have that same coefficient. Um, I'm going to just check in real quick. Your video froze. Do you still have me? Can you hear me and see my screen and everything? Maybe not. Oh, maybe you're back. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Uh, now we can. Okay. So I don't know how much of, of what I just said, uh, how much of that you caught, but I was just mentioning that the, the equation for an ellipse is similar to a circle in that both the x and the y are squared, but they'll have different coefficients. Um, we're going to not, we won't derive that equation like we did with the parabola, but what we will do is um, uh, we're going to derive a special relationship between A, B, and C. So what makes something a point on the ellipse is that uh, the sum of the distances, you know, if I take this point, any point on the ellipse, say for this point, P, X, Y, then when I find the distance from each focus and I add them up, I will always get the same sum. So we're going to find D1 plus D2 for a couple of cleverly or specially chosen points. And I'm going to start, actually, we're going to find D1 plus D2 for the point A0. So D1 will be the distance. I'm going to be making lots of marks and then having to erase them a little bit so I can remark for other things that we want. But here's the distance I want. The D1 is the distance from A0 to this vertex um, on the negative x-axis. So it's this distance here that I'm kind of putting in bold red. That's a horizontal distance. So it's a right x minus left x. So that's a minus a negative c or a plus c. d1 is a, or let me just sort of spell it out. So the distance from negative c 0 to a 0 is a plus c. And then the distance from C0 to A0 that's just this horizontal distance here. 
it's still horizontal, so I'm still just going to take the right x minus the left x. In this case, that's a minus c. So that means that the sum of the distances, d1 plus d2, if I add those up, the plus c and the minus c cancel, and we just get 2a. So I just want to, you know, let, let's, let's see what this means here. Let's think about this. The ellipse is defined to be the set of all points such that the sum of the distances is constant, never changes, right? So that means that no matter which point we pick on the ellipse, if I find the sum of the distances, it'll always be equal to 2a. All right, so that's our first point that we picked. Um, let's do this process again. And I'm going to scroll back up to look at the figure here. This time, this time we're going to find the sum of the distances for this point 0b. So d1 is this distance here. And to find that distance, you know, it's no longer just perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical. It's a slanty distance. But we can draw a little right triangle here, right? We could use the distance formula, sure, but we can also just visualize it and use Pythagoras kind of more faster than we could kind of plug things into the distance formula, I bet. That's a right triangle. I know that the sum, the vertical leg has length b. And that horizontal leg has to have length c, right? Because it's from the origin out to negative c0. And so if I just use Pythagoras, that first, that d1 distance is going to be the square root of b squared plus c squared. So if we find d2, this other distance, um, that's from 0b to the point c0. What do you think that's going to be? Oh, you guys froze again. Can you? Oh, okay. I think you're back. Great. <laughs> uh, what do we think that distance will be from the 0b to c0? Can you say that louder? Yeah, right. So this we have some symmetry here, right? That's the same right triangle. It's just sort of flipped over the y-axis. So that's going to be the same thing, the square root of b squared plus c squared. And so when we add these up, d1 plus d2 is just 2 times the square root of b squared plus c squared. OK, look, we found that when I picked a0, that sum of the distances was 2a. When I picked 0b, the sum of the distances was 2 times the radical b squared plus c squared. But what makes this, what makes an ellipse an ellipse is that the sum of the distances never changes. So these two things have to be equal. So 
So, what that gets us is that uh, 2a is equal to 2 times the square root of b squared plus c squared. And we're just going to simplify this. We're going to rewrite this. We could, you know, divide both sides by 2. a is equal to the square root of b squared plus c squared. And now let's get rid of the um, radical. And we get something that looks almost like a permutation of uh, Pythagoras, but um, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. This is true for all ellipses. Um, and, and in particular, when we think about this equation as it relates to the ellipse that we see up here, I'm going to scroll up briefly. When we look at this particular ellipse, it looks like a, a relation between the coordinates A, B, and C, you know, the coordinates of the vertices and ends of the minor and the, and the two foci. Um, but it is always, it, this, this, this holds for every ellipse, no matter where it's centered, if we understand that A, B, and C are the distances from the origin to the vertex, to the end of the minor, to the focus, to each focus, respectively. So um, I just want to kind of uh, jot that down, uh, you know, in all this extra room I seem to have. So. All right, um, are we ready to move on from this page? Anybody still writing? Okay. So we, you know, in, on that page we had looked at this generic uh, ellipse with a center at the origin and it was oriented horizontally. We could also have an ellipse oriented vertically and it just, you know, looks basically the same, only the two foci are on the y-axis and uh, the vertices are on the y-axis and the ends of the minor are on the x-axis. Um, the, the foci are always along the major axis. Um, and if the um, vertex, or sorry, if the ellipse is oriented vertically, then the equation looks like this, really similar to the last equation, right? The last equation was x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. We just have sort of moved around the x squared and the y squared. Um, so the difference is which variable is over the a squared and which variable is over the b squared. And here a and b in this equation are the same as, you know, a and b as they appear, you know, as, as coordinates or distances from the center. Um, so if I look at an ellipse, right, the major axis is the long one. A has to be bigger than B, always, right? So I could tell, if I'm looking at an ellipse equation in standard form, I could tell whether it's oriented vertically or horizontally just by looking at which variable is over the bigger number. So in this equation, they give us x squared over 25 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. 
Is that oriented vertically or horizontally? Horizontally, the big number's under the X, so it's gotta be oriented horizontally. Um, and we can do a quick sketch um, with, you know, just, we can glean a lot of information from this and, and uh, sketch it pretty quickly. If, uh, I guess they didn't ask us to sketch. Oh, it does get, say sketch, yeah. And get, a, and get a sketch of this curve. So the major axis we said was the X axis and that's because 25 is bigger than nine. Um, so we know that A squared is equal to 25 and so A is five. And if I know the value of A, that ought to get us our vertices. Since this is centered at the origin, the value of A is actually the actual coordinate of the, of the vertex, or plus or minus A. So um, our vertices are at 5, 0, and negative 5, 0. We know that b squared is equal to 9, so b is equal to 3, and so the ends of the minor are at 0, 3, and 0, negative 3. They asked us to sketch it, but they also asked us to find uh, the vertices, which we did find already, and the foci. They didn't ask us for the ends of the minor, but if I were going to sketch it, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't sketch it without finding the ends of the minor anyway. That's sort of a necessary piece of information. Um, I know what A and B are, so if I want the foci, we can use that equation we derived on the previous page. We know that for every ellipse, A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared. I know what A squared and B squared are. So c squared is a squared minus b squared, which is 25 minus 9, or 16. And that means that c is 4. Um, foci are always on the major axis. So that's the x-axis in this case. So these will have the coordinates 4, 0, and negative four, zero. And then we could just do a quick sketch, do the best we can, freehand. It's not too bad. Um, questions on that example? Okay. All right. Let's do another one. Uh, same thing, that only this time they don't ask us to sketch it. We just want coordinates of the vertices, ends of the minor, and the foci for this ellipse. Okay, so this ellipse is not in standard form. Can somebody point out why it's not in standard form? Because it doesn't equal one. Doesn't equal one. Yeah. With every ellipse, if it's in standard form, it's equal to one, regardless of where it's centered, right? So, um, so we need to set this equal to one. You know, I guess there's a couple ways we could think about doing that. If if I subtracted 63 from both sides, it would be equal to one, but that wouldn't be in standard form either. Uh, so what we want to do is actually just divide um, both sides by 64.
So then we get x squared over 16 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. Which way is this oriented? Horizontal again, the, the bigger numbers under the x squared. That's really important. If we're going to find coordinates of the vertex, you know, vertices and ends in the minor and, and the foci, we need to know which way it's oriented. Um, so we just do the same thing, right? a squared is equal to 16, so a is 4. And we get our vertices. What are the coordinates of the vertices? Four zero, four, zero. 4, 0, and 4, 0. Um, all right, what's next? Uh-huh, so what do we, where do we go from here? Mm-hmm, great. So where are the ends of the minor? Great. So we have two of the things that uh, they asked us to find. We have the vertices and ends in the minor. Then they asked us to find the foci. How do we get that? Square equals A squared minus B squared equals a squared minus b squared, right? Because a squared is b squared plus c squared. Great. So we get to use that equation again. It's not that in all problems that equation is handy, but, you know, often enough that I, you know, it's one of the first things I think of when I'm working with an ellipse. Um, so a squared minus b squared is 16 minus 4, or 12. So then c is root 12. And I'm going to just um, simplify that. So we have a pair of twos. So 2 root 3. So that means that our foci are at 2 root 3, 0, because it's on the major axis. So that's our x coordinate and negative 2 root 3, 0. In these two examples that we just did, these were ones where they gave us uh, the equation, right, the algebraic information about this ellipse and asked us to find geometric information about it. In this next example, they're flipping it around. They're giving us geometric information. They're saying, we want to find the equation of an ellipse that has its center at the origin. They tell us some geometric information, they give us one end of the minor axis, and then they tell us a point that it passes through. So if it's an ellipse with its center at the origin, I know what the standard equation looks like. I just don't know which variable is over the a squared, right? So how do I tell which way this is oriented? The minor. Say that one more time. Yeah, the one end of the minor is is the point two zero, which is on the x-axis. So that means that the major axis has to be the y-axis. So this tells us two things: one, that the y-axis is major. What else does it tell us? Yeah, b squared is equal to 4. So if the y-axis is major, that means that I'm going to start with the equation y squared over a squared plus x squared over b squared, but we know b squared is 4, equals 1. We got a lot of information from this first bit. We want 
to find the equation of the ellipse, the only thing that we're missing is the value of a squared. So uh, this other piece of information they gave us says, passes through the point 1 root 6. What can we do when we know the coordinates of a point that's on the curve? Yeah, perfect. So since it passes through 1 root 6, we're going to substitute x equals 1, y equals root 6. So this looks like root 6 squared over a squared plus 1 squared over 4 equals 1, or 6 over a squared plus 1 fourth equals 1. There's more than one way we could go about solving this, more than one, you know, first step we could take here, or more than one next step we could take here. What do you want to do? What do you think uh, we could do here to help us get closer to finding the value of a squared? Subtract a quarter from both sides. So we have six, oops, six over a squared is equal to three quarters. What now? Multiply both sides by a squared. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to multiply both sides by 4a squared, because I really like clearing all denominators if I can. That gives us a nice equation with no fractions. So then we have 24 is equal to 3a squared. And now it's all over but the shouting, right? We're just going to divide both sides by 3, and we have a squared. We don't need to find a. They didn't actually ask us to find the vertices. They just want the equation. So knowing the value of a squared is enough. And we're just going to put that into the equation that we had started with. That you know, we kind of made some progress uh, above here, right? Just knowing what the value of b is and how it was oriented. So now we've got a y squared over eight plus x squared over four equals one. Um, questions so far? Okay, great. Um, so we've been focusing on ellipses that have their center at the origin. Um, now we're going to take some time and uh, look at vertices that may be centered elsewhere. And the way that we obtain the equation, you know, if we know the center is not at 0, 0, but it's at some point hk, hopefully the equations on this uh, next page won't be, in, you know, particularly surprising. It's the same thing we do when our, the circle, uh, the center of a circle is anywhere other than the origin, 0, 0, right? We replace x with x minus h and y with y minus k. It's what we did when we uh, had a parabola whose vertex was not at the origin. So it's that same kind of pattern. You know, this is how we do a translation of axes. Um, you just replace x with x minus h and y with y minus k in those standard forms. Um, so here, uh, we'll, we'll do one where they give us this equation that's already in standard form. Which way is this oriented? Horizontal. Horizontal. We know because the big number's oh. under the x squared. And um, uh, let's see. So if we're going to sketch this, let's find its center. What should the center be? Three 
Three and negative two. So now is where I'm going to keep in mind that A, B, and C are not necessarily coordinates of the you know vertices, ends of the minor, and focus, but they are they represent distances. How far I got to go from the center to get to a vertex, to get to an end of a minor, to get to a focus. So um, the center is at three negative two. We know that a squared is equal to twenty five. So a is five. And I'm going to start sketching first. So the the um, center is at three negative two. There's the center. A is equal to five and it's oriented horizontally, so that means I'm going to go out to the left, uh, to the left five units and to the right five units to get my two vertices. Um, like when I write out the coordinates. You know, whether you choose to do that by sketching it first and then kind of seeing where the coordinates line up, that a lot of people like to do that, or you could think of it as it's on the same horizontal as that uh, the center, so that means that the y coordinate is going to be the same. We know the y coordinate for each vertex is going to be negative two, and then I'm just going to add and subtract five from the x coordinate three. So the vertices are going to be three minus five is negative two, negative two and uh, 8, negative 2. We know that b squared is equal to 9, so b is equal to 3, and this is the information we're going to use to get the ends of the minor. Um, So the ends of the minor are, I'm going to go up three units and down three units. So that means that for the end of each, or, or the, each end of the minor axis, the x coordinate will be the same as the vertex. I'm just going to add and subtract three from the y coordinate to go up three and down three. So negative two plus three is one, negative two minus three is negative five. And we wanted, you know, the only thing they asked us to do was to sketch it. So, you know, if we have the vertices and the ends of the minor, that's probably enough to get a sketch. And then if you like, you could find the each focus. And you would do that the same way that we did before. You know, you could find the value of c by using the equation a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And then c represents a distance that you go out uh, from the vertex to get to each focus. Um, questions on that example? All right. So we got one more. I saved the best for last because they gave us an equation that's not in standard form. How do I, how can I tell right now that it's an ellipse just by looking at the equation? Say, can you say that louder? Yeah, it's got the x squared and the y squared. They're both squared. Yeah, I've got both squared variables, but different coefficients. So I can tell it's an ellipse. And to get something in standard form when I that involves squared variables, we're going to complete the square. We did it on the circle. We did it on the parabola. We're going to do it on the ellipse. With the ellipse, we have to be a little bit more careful. Um, with the circle, you know, we always want to complete the square on one x squared and one y squared, right? So with the circle, we could just divide through by whatever coefficient. 
to make that coefficient 1. But look, if I divide through by 2, I'm going to mess up that coefficient on y squared. So instead of dividing, what we're going to do is actually factor uh, things out. So um, just to get things ready, I'm going to start by rewriting it. I'm going to have my 2x squared plus 8x. So I'm going to group my x with my x squared. I'm going to have my y squared and then minus 8y. I'm going to throw that on the other side. And then, of course, we always want our constant over by itself. Our constant here is just 0. There's, there was no other constant term. So the y squared's all set. The y squared, I'm ready to complete the square on that. It's just the x squared that we have to worry about with this coefficient. So we're going to factor that 2 out, but just from the first two terms. And we're allowed to do that. Um, if I take out a 2 from just the first two terms, oh, I'm going to leave some space after. Um, what goes in those parentheses? Great. And then I'm leaving space because I'm going to complete the square inside the parentheses. So let's complete the square on x. What do we need to do? Yeah, so that coefficient on 4. Uh, sorry, the coefficient on x. So we're going to cut that in half and square it. So 2 squared. Now, we have to add the same thing to the other side. But be careful. We did not just add 2 squared to the left side. Because that 2 squared is sitting inside a set of parentheses that's being multiplied by 2. We actually added 2 times 2 squared. And so... We're going to add 2 times 2 squared. Now, we don't have to worry about that with the y because that uh, coefficient is already 1. Um, what do we need to add to both sides to complete the square on y? Yeah. I'm going to pause here for a moment and just see if there are questions on that process. So, all right, so the stuff in the parentheses with the x's, that's a perfect square. What is it the perfect square of? Perfect. So I'm bringing down this factor of 2 outside the parentheses, and then we have x plus 2 squared. And then what about the y's? Y minus 4. Mm-hmm. So y minus 4 squared. And then we have some arithmetic to do on the other side. So we've got, uh, that's 4 times 2 is 8 plus 16 is 24. We have completed the square. It's just not quite in standard form yet. How do I know it's not in standard form? It doesn't equal 1. doesn't equal 1. So what are we going to do? Divide by 24. Great. So we have x plus 2 squared over 12 plus y minus 4 squared over 24 equals 1. There's the standard form. Now, I have a confession to make. I, I feel like I didn't allow for quite enough room to do all the calculations we need to do. If you have, if you need, uh, you know, you might need to grab an extra sheet of paper. I'm going to cheat because on one note, I have magic paper. I just get to scroll down, and then there's more stuff more room for me here. Uh, but we here's our equation. We want to find the center vertices, foci, and ellipse. Uh, and uh, center vertices, foci, and then sketch the ellipse. Um, one of these is pretty easy to get right off. What's the center? Negative 2, 4. Negative 2, 4. Okay. Now I'm going to scroll down 
to do some of the rest of this. Um, which way is this oriented? Vertically, perfect. So we know that a squared is 24, which means that a is root 24. Now, um, let's see, we could simplify this. 24 is 4 times 6, 4 is 2 times 2, so this is 2 root 6. Um, we're going to use this information to sketch it, so I'm going to have to use A as a distance that I'm going to go from the center. Uh, so I'm actually going to just um, approximate that on, on the calculator. Uh, hold, hold on, i got to, the calculator's not in reach, I'm going to grab it real quick. Okay, so 2 root 6 is about 4.89 or about 4.9. I'm, I'm rounding it kind of rough here because um, I'm going to use that value to sketch, and I, I know I'm not going to be able to <laughs> sketch it um, more accurate than to the tenths and probably not even quite that accurate. Um, we know that b squared is 12. And so b is root 12, which is 2 root 3, and that's about 3 and a half. So if I use the value of a, this is oriented vertically, if I'm using the value of a, to get vertices, since it's oriented vertically, I'm just going to add and subtract A from the Y coordinate of the center. So that's uh, negative 2, comma, and then 4 plus or minus 4.9, and that's uh, 8.9 and negative 0 0.9. Uh, let's see, the ends of the minor, that's how far I'm going to go out left and right. So I'm going to take the same It'll have the same y coordinate. We're going to add and subtract three and a half from the x coordinate. So that gives us one point five, one and a half, four, and um, Uh, negative five and a half, four, approximately. This is enough to get a sketch, so I'm going to do that first. Whoops. Uh, So our center is at negative 2, 4. Our, uh, let's see, we're going to go up and down about 4.9 to get each vertex, so close to 5. And then we're going to go to the left and to the right, about three and a half units. To get to each end of the minor. So 
So this is kind of enough to sketch it. Looks something like that. Um, and then the last thing they asked us to find was the foci. So we know that uh, a squared is b squared plus c squared. And so c squared is a squared minus b squared. And we could throw in our values, 24 minus 12. So we get 12 for c squared, which means c is also uh, 2 root 3, or approximately and a half. So the foci are always on the major axis. So it'll have the same x coordinate, but we're going to add and subtract three and a half from the y coordinate. So that will be negative two and then four plus or minus three and a half. And that would give us negative two seven and a half and negative two one half approximately so that's be like up here and down here Um, so that we did a lot in that problem. Are there are there questions on uh, how we kind of figured out each piece? Okay. Okay. Um, so that th that wraps up uh, this first chapter for us. Tomorrow there's a quiz. Here's what you can expect on quizzes in general. Um, the quizzes are usually, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and say never more than four questions. They're almost always exactly four questions, and sometimes there are only three questions. So we'll have four questions from material throughout this chapter. You will definitely need to uh, complete the square on at least one problem, probably exactly one problem. I haven't written it yet. So, you know, complete the square to get some equation, some given equation in standard form. There will probably be a problem where you're going to be given we're going to find an equation from geometric information given. Um, definitely, there'll probably be a question on that first day's material, like that basic definitions or um, like, you know, some question that, you know, makes us think about uh, distances between points or something. Um, uh, you know, probably there, there's five sections. There's only going to be four questions, so obviously there's not going to be a question on everything. But um, but uh, you should expect the, the idea of like measuring distances between points to come up. And I think that's probably about as much information as I can give you about it, about what to expect. Oh, and um, at least at least two questions will come directly from the assigned practice exercises.
you know, my intention when I write quizzes and tests, for that matter, is that, you know, for folks, you know, students who are spending time on the exercises aren't really going to be surprised by anything they see. It doesn't mean that there won't be, you know, some hard questions, but, um, but I don't pick the hardest questions to put on a quiz. They're designed to be kind of short-ish, um, you know, something you could sit down and finish in like 20 minutes or something. And, um, uh, but kind of give us an idea, some feedback on, on how we're doing. Um, if you have questions as you're working on exercises, feel free to text or call um, or email. Um, and I will get the quiz in um, up on, on, I will email the quiz uh, later today. So you'll, uh, you'll be all set to take it tomorrow. I'll also have that uh, problem set uh, ready later today as well. Any questions before we adjourn? Okay. Well then, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I'll see you all on Monday.